Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Roxy Meyer from the Bank of Prairie du Sac, and this is our 15th Economic Outlook. So we're very pleased to be able to present this again this year. For the audience, how many, is this the first time you've ever been here for one of our events? Raise your hand. Good. So we have a lot of people that are returning, so wonderful. Good. Our speaker this morning to start out with is Dr. Stephen Deller. Dr. Deller is a professor of agricultural and applied economics at University of Wisconsin-Madison. He also is a community development economist, econ excuse me, economist at University of Wisconsin Extension. Dr. Deller has been with us, I believe, every year. And again, we are so very happy that he's able to join us again today. So welcome, Dr. Deller. Thank you. Has it 15 years? Wow. Um, thank you for coming, and I feel disappointed the weather has broken. It's not sub-zero out there. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, I think you've got to turn it on. I've got to turn it on. There we go. Every, every year we do this, we do a couple of things. One is we kind of give a, a, an overview of what's happening to the local economy. When I say the local economy, I'm kind of talking about the Salt County region. And then kind of do, uh, uh, you know, what is the, what's the potential economic outlook look like? And um, then we try to weave in something a little bit different every year. Last year we talked about the housing market. Um, this year I want to kind of talk about what's the business community look like in Sauk Prairie. So that's kind of where we're going to be going today, is we're going to be looking at some general economic trends and then kind of a profile of the local business community to kind of give you an idea of the types of businesses that are within this community and then the economic outlook, okay? Again, what are some of the basic <clears throat> kind of measures that we look at when we look at how an economy is doing? Well, the first one is population. What's happening to population? And a lot of what changes population here is the, 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 the natural population growth rate is kind of stable uh, from year to year. It's, down, it's trending downward a little bit in the U.S., but most of the population change comes from people moving in and out of the community, kind of net migration. So when you see population growing in a particular area, a lot of that population growth, almost all of that population growth, is coming from people moving into the community. Now the question is, is why would people want to move into the Sauk Prairie area? Well, they move into the area because uh, we used to historically think that it was in terms of jobs. We always used to think that people follow jobs. You generate employment opportunities and people move in to take those jobs. That's slowly changing. Increasingly, what we're finding is that jobs follow people. It's a change in the way the, the, the economy is structured in terms of the way the businesses are being generated or employment is being generated. But increasingly, we want to look at kind of what's driving people moving in. Now, when you look at Salt County, which is the red line there, you can see that there was strong growth from 2000 up to the Great Recession, and then it's kind of flattened out, okay? Uh, we're growing a little bit slower than the U.S. overall, uh, but we're growing faster than the Great Lakes. Um, but we're not growing, well, Dane County's. I put Dane County in there because I think it's, it comes in later in terms of economic opportunities for the area. But what we're seeing here in terms of population growth is relatively steady growth. Steady, even, positive growth, okay, which is kind of a good indicator. What's that suggesting is that there's more people tending to moving into the Salt County area than moving out, okay? What about employment? Um, again, you can see the growth from 2000 up to the Great Recession. There's been a very slow recovery in terms of employment growth from the Great Recession. And this is fairly true for a lot of more rural areas around Wisconsin and the U.S. Rural areas or less densely populated areas have just had a much slower recovery from the Great Recession. And it's only been recently that it's starting to pick up. And that's what we're seeing in Sauk County. We're seeing over the last three years, we're actually seeing some positive growth in employment. Okay? So we're starting to see, the, finally, we're starting to see the effects of the recovery from the Great Recession. Okay? One of the things that's really important here, I think, is uh, one of the big issues that is facing a lot of communities across Wisconsin is um, labor force, is how many people have job openings at their businesses and they're having a hard time filling those jobs, okay? You're not alone, 
Okay, that's an issue that's facing a lot of us. One way that we can get a little bit of an insight in terms of what's happening there is to look at this thing called the population employment ratio. This is simply the number of people that live in the county divided by the number of jobs that are in the county. Okay? And historically, um, you can look at how Salt County and Dane County compare to the U.S. and the Great Lakes. There are a lot more jobs in Salt County than there are people. Okay? And that trend has been relatively flat and constant. This is part of the reason that there's a labor shortage in the Wisconsin area is because we pretty much tapped out the number of people that are available. It's not that we have necessarily a skills gap. Well, we do have skills gaps when you get down into the weeds uh, on certain things. But the big picture is we simply don't have enough bodies to fill the jobs that we're generating. Okay? And the only way to really address this is to try to get more people to move into the area to take these jobs. Okay? Now, we have to kind of think about why are people, why would people want to move into the area? Okay? Now, the unemployment rate, um, this is, you can essentially see that we're at historic unemployment rates. Um, this is something that is probably not new. There aren't a lot of people sitting on the sidelines waiting for work. Okay? Economists talk about what's the natural rate of unemployment. There will always be some people that are unemployed because there's always business churn. There's always businesses that are opening, expanding, contracting, closing. There's always churn. Okay? So we're always going to have some level of unemployment. Now the question is, what is a good level of unemployment? And here economists disagree. Uh, it used to be around 4%. Now it's maybe 3.5%. But any way you look at this, we have an unemployment rate here in the county that is really below 3%. There is a labor shortage. Basically, anybody who wants a job can find a job, okay? Which is actually a good situation to be in, okay? But one of the things, and oops, 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 I went, went too far. If you look across the state, you can actually see that there are very few pockets where you actually have fairly high unemployment rates. You have to go up into the northern state or the northern counties to really kind of get higher rates of unemployment. Almost across the board, you see unemployment rates that are fairly low. Dane County and Iowa County is 2.1, 2.2%. This is really a very, very, very tight labor market. Okay, and this is part of what you're experiencing, not being able to hire folks, because there simply aren't people out there that are looking for jobs. Okay? Now, one of the things is that when you're looking for that labor people to hire, generally you think about, if I have a business in Sauk City, right, where do you draw your labor from? Your first inclination is probably Sauk City, right? But what we're finding is that the rate of commuting, the number of folks that are commuting, has just really exploded. It used to be you lived in a community, you w worked in that community, you shopped in that community, and you went to church in that community. Not anymore. Okay? You live here, you work over there, you shop over there, and, well, you don't go to church anymore. Okay? But this is something that a colleague of mine, Mac Harris, <coughs> has been looking at. And what we're looking at here is the percent of folks that stretch commute. And we say stretch commute, we're talking about commuting more than 50 miles one way to go to work. Okay, how many of you commute more than 50 miles to go to work? Okay, you would be in this. Okay, now this is what it is in 2002. Let's run through this and see what happens over time. The darker the shade, the higher the percentage of folks that are stretch commuting. 2006, 2008, coming out of the Great Recession, 2012, 2014. What's happening here is that people are kind of changing their residence behavior. Remember when I said that what used to be that people follow jobs? This is evidence that it's no longer people following jobs, it's jobs following people. People are starting to change their location decision. People are making the decision, I want to live here and I'm willing to drive 
someplace else to go to work. Okay, now notice, why isn't Saw County and Dane County showing up like that? Showing up as a dark blue? How far away is Middleton and Madison from here? 30 miles, you don't hit the definition of stretch commuting, okay? So why 50 miles? Well, that's what's kind of how it's defined in the academic literature. If we cut that down to 30 miles, I think that there would be even a greater share of folks that are commuting greater distances. So this is really interesting. And what we're, we're trying to figure out what's driving this. And what we're finding is the predominant thing is housing costs, okay? People are willing to travel, commute to work in order to have better housing, okay? So how many of you been in the, have looked at the, the housing market in Madison? Any of you just out of curiosity looked at the housing market in Madison? What's it like? Horrible. horrible. Why is it horrible? Prices are too high. A colleague of mine is, um, they're getting married and they just bought a starter home. This is a little house, it's not very big, it's two bedroom, it's not a very big house, I think it's 1,500 square feet, it's not a very big lot, it's on the near west side of Madison. Guess how much that house costs them? $275,000. $325,000. And it needs work, okay? So if I have a job in Madison, right, and I'm looking at that kind of housing market, what are my alternatives? Renting, ooh, wow. Renting prices have just gone through the rough. Remember, I don't know if you were here last time, but the real stress is in the rental market, okay? It's because people can't afford to buy houses, they go into the rental market, and that this drives renting prices sky high, okay? And that was one of the things from last year, is that if there's, a, if there's housing stress in this area, it's in the rental market, okay? Back Keep going back on these. Yeah, uh, well, uh, what I'm just curious about, if you look at the, the upper quarter part of the state, and everybody's driving, so where are they driving? <coughs> so what, what they're doing is they decide, I want to live here, and my job is way over there. Okay. 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 So, that's, so that's, what they're, that's what they're basically making the decision is, I want to live here. This is where I want to live. Oh, my job happens to be way over there. Okay. For example, my wife teaches at UW-Whitewater. What percent of the faculty at UW-Whitewater live in Madison? 40? Close, almost a third. Yeah. Okay, why? Well, it's Madison, okay? So when you're thinking about looking at labor markets on where to tap into potential employees, you've got to think much broader. You've got to look outside the region. Okay, because that's how people are changing their taste and preferences. This also has an implication in terms of um, future ways in, in which to think about economic development. Okay, now share proprietorship, share of employment that's coming from proprietorships. I've talked a lot in the past about the role of small business development and entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is vital for the economy to grow, and a simple measure of this is proprietorship income, or proprietorship employment. And you can see that um, Wisconsin historically is below the national average. Dane County, why is Dane County so low? You know, state government, epic. Uh, universities, part of state government. Okay, so although all the small businesses that we have in Dane County and Madison, it's still the university and state government and companies like Epic still dominate. Okay, but when you look at SOC, you can see that there's actually kind of a plateau there and a little bit of a growth in uh, proprietorship. Proprietorship is really important. Okay. Per capita income, you can see relative growth in terms of per capita income, but this is kind of a reflection of Saw County is that um, the income levels in Saw County tend to be a little bit on the lower side. So while we're seeing population growth, we're seeing return to employment growth, 
income is still a little bit on the low side. Okay? Now, cost of living here is a little bit cheaper, so that kind of help compensates for that, but that's something that you may want to think about. Okay? For example, uh, if you're working with promoting a type of business to expand, okay, are you better off working with a business that can add 100 jobs but that pays $15 an hour, or a business that can expand and employ 20 people but are paying $25 an hour? What type of business do you want expanding in the community? Okay? Got to start thinking about wages. Okay? Most of the income that comes into uh, Sauk County is coming from work. Okay, but it's 64%. So a typical dollar of income coming in, 64 cents of that comes from work. The other sources are dividend and interest and rent and retirement income. That retirement income component is actually getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, you look at like income maintenance, that's like unemployment insurance, things like that. It's really a very small sliver. So really what's happening is that we're seeing um, not as much money coming in from work and more coming from other passive types of activities. <clears throat> now as we age as a society, that's gonna become more and more and more important, okay? If you look at this over time, look at retirement income. It's this kind of yellowish. Notice how it's slowly getting bigger and bigger and bigger. If you take this all the way back to 1969, which is where this data starts, you can just see this, this this kind of area just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So a bigger source of income is really coming from non-work sources. Okay, <clears throat> so what's happening to the regional economy? The regional economy is performing at a slow but steady pace. Now this is something that you need to think about as a community is that do you want slow and steady or do you want something a little bit faster? Okay. A lot of communities prefer slow and steady because it keeps the character of the community. Okay. If you grow too rapidly, it can change the character of the community. Okay. But this is something that you need to decide. A lot of communities decide they want to pursue tour tourism and recreation, but we don't want to be like the Wisconsin Dells. Okay. There's a balance there. And right now, Salt County in the region is showing steady growth. Okay. The low unemployment and slow population growth will create a bottleneck for economic growth, okay? We simply do not have enough job or enough people to fill the jobs. Now, one of the things that's happening here is that how are businesses responding to this? One is they're increasing wages, which is good, because that's gonna help income go up. Okay, what's the other thing that a lot of businesses are looking at? Automation. Okay, any of you in the dairy industry? How many farmers are moving towards robotic milking? A lot. Why? They can't find the labor. Okay, that's a big reason. Okay, when you go to a grocery store, uh, do they have the self-checkout? Do you use that self-checkout? That's a form of automation, okay? I have some friends that refuse to use um, self-checkout because it's taking a job away from somebody. It depends on how fast I want to get out, okay? Expanding commuting sheds mean more people live in one place and work in another place, okay? This is one of the things that I've always been impressed about the Sauk Prairie area is that you work as a group. You work as a region, and I think that's extremely important. And that regional approach of working with your neighbors has become, become more and more important over time, okay? People follow jobs or do jobs follow people? Increasingly, we're thinking that jobs follow people. Now, what this means from an economic development perspective is kind of shifting away from focusing on trying to attract businesses and more on attracting people. Why would people want to live here? Okay. Why do you live here? What keeps you here? Notions of quality of life are becoming increasingly important. Okay? Uh, we invest in parks. Wasn't there just an announcement that there's going to be the Culver, the Culver Recreation? That. Okay? 
Can you directly connect the dots that investing in the Culver's Community Park is going to lead to economic growth and development? Can you make that direct connection? It's very difficult, but that's what the research is suggesting. Okay, Madison right now has four city golf courses, and they're losing money hand over fist. Okay, what is the city of Madison debating? Do we keep those city golf courses? In this framework, yes, you do, because it adds to the quality of life in the area. Okay? I believe that you've got a school referendum that is coming up. In this kind of a framework, you seriously want to think about investing in schools. Now, historically, you think, well, you invest in schools so that we produce good labor, human capital that can take jobs. This kind of turns that on its head and say, no, we want to invest in our schools, and we're willing to tax ourselves to invest in our schools because that's a quality that will attract people. Okay? A colleague of mine, Randy Stoker, did a survey of uh, millennials and what attracts millennials. And what do you think is, you know, what draws millennials to a particular place to live, particularly in rural areas? What's number one? Mm, close. Close. Safety. They want to be able to walk their dog at night and feel safe. Okay? That's number one. Number two is schools. Why? Because millennials are starting to have kids. That's very, very high. Then it comes to recreation. Then it comes to things like being able to eat out and that type of stuff. Okay? These quality of life attributes. Now, those millennials are showing or revealing what they're willing to do is, I want to live here, but I'm willing to travel 50 miles to go to work. Now, with all the employment that's booming in Madison, what is that, where does that position Salt Prairie? Okay? There's a real opportunity here to get more folks to move into the area, and they work in Madison. Bless their hearts. Okay? Driving up here, the number of cars that are going down, actually the number of cars that are going both ways, commuting both ways, is really quite amazing. Okay? There's more going south towards Madison than coming up this way, but it's a reflection of that change in commuting patterns. Okay? Invest in parks, recreation, quality schools. That's what we just talked about. Now, what about the types of businesses that are in the Sauk Prairie area? Okay. Um, what is that? About 7,000 jobs, if I can do the math in my head? Most of the businesses in the Sauk Prairie area, and this is Sauk Prairie, the, the, two, the two cities, or are they villages? Villages. Um, this does not include the, the surrounding communities. Um, the vast majority are uh, non-employer businesses. And what non-employer businesses means is they don't have a paid employee. Okay, it's basically the person themselves. Okay? If I am running my own business and I get to a point where I need to hire somebody, then I flip from an, a non-employer to an employer business. Okay, so what this is saying is the vast majority of businesses that are in the area are actually pretty small. Okay? This is that role of that entrepreneurship is really important here. Okay? Indeed, if you define, again, we get into this definitional thing of what do you, how do you define a small business. Um, I think I've mentioned in the past that if you go to the business school on the Madison campus, they define any business with less than 500 employees as a small business. That's, that's yeah. Exactly, that's nuts, right? So even if you say, let's look at employ uh, businesses that have more than 100 employees, that's less than 3% of the businesses that are in the area have more than 100 employees. The vast majority of businesses are small, okay? Almost 50% have less than five employees, okay? So if you're thinking about developing kind of economic development policies to help the businesses that are right here, should those policies be aimed at helping the big guys or should those policies be aimed at trying to help the smaller businesses, okay? This is something that we get into in terms of economic development policy debates all the time. Are you better off spending your time trying to work on these businesses and get these businesses to grow bigger or working on these businesses? Okay, 
There's no wrong answer. It's simply a choice of which way do you want to focus your energy. Okay? If you look across the two communities, you can see that there's a very similar pattern. Uh, you can actually identify specific businesses here if you want to. Uh, I won't name which business is which, but I'm sure you can probably guess which one is which. I'm sure that you probably have an idea of what business that is. Okay. So if you think about it in terms of not the number of businesses, but the number of jobs, uh, then we do get in the situation that some of these bigger businesses actually account for more of the jobs than these smaller businesses. So that's another piece of information to help you think through <clears throat> how you want to approach economic development. I have a question on this. So your um, businesses that you're putting on here, are they the specific location here in Prairie Sag or Sauk Yes, so yes. Corporate setting, like so. I work for United Cooperative as well, and we're a corporation. You know, our headquarters is in Beaver Dam, and our locations all over the state. Then you're not in here. So it's it's not our location here in South City is not on here. Probably not. A large corporation. Probably not. Okay. Exactly. So, so like a branch bank, yeah. a branch bank would not show up in here. Because it's all over. It's reported someplace else. It's reported at the home. Okay. The home corporation. Okay. So these are all businesses that have their mailing address within the two villages. Gotcha. Okay, so the average number of jobs in Perdisac is about 18 people, and in Sauk City, it's about 10. The average across the two is about 14 people per job, or per business, okay? So what's happening, though, is that you've got a couple of businesses that are really kind of pulling that average up. But the vast majority of businesses are actually down in here. Okay. Now in terms of revenue, uh, I'm not sure how much I trust these numbers. Uh, I just put it up here because they kind of give you a, an idea here, is the vast majority of businesses have less, have less than half a million dollars in sales. And when you think about the vast majority of businesses that are not employer businesses, that kind of makes sense. Okay, if I'm, a, if I'm an independent contractor and I'm it, right, uh, my sales are probably going to be somewhere in here. Okay, there's only a couple businesses that are up in this higher end. And again, we won't name businesses, but you can get an idea here. So again, the vast majority of businesses tend to be small. Okay. Now, again, these averages kind of get distorted because you got a couple of businesses that are up in here that are essentially pulling that average up. But if you look back at kind of this average and then compare it to this average, you know, we're talking medium-sized businesses here is the typical business. But again, be aware that you've got a couple out here that are kind of pulling that average up. Okay. Now, what are these businesses in? Okay. This is a pretty nice, even distribution of businesses. I like this. Okay. From an account, one of the things that we've done a lot of work on is um, the characteristics of communities. How hard did the Great Recession hit them? And how well did they recover from the Great Recession? And one of the things that we found consistent the one result that comes out again and again and again is the more diversified your economy, the better. Okay? The more diversified your economy, which means you have more activity across a lot of different sectors, okay, you will essentially have been hit less hard by the Great Recession and you will have recovered from the Great Recession faster. Now the logic of that, how many of you manage your own retirement portfolio? Okay. Do you put all of your funds into one item? What do you do? Yeah, spread it around. Okay. It's called portfolio theory. All right. That's exactly what you're supposed to be doing, is spread your wealth around. Okay. Here, this to me is essentially saying that you've got a nice distribution here. Now, in terms of health care, right, that Prairie de Sac, look at that spike on health care. 
Now, this is kind of an odd way. Is anybody from the hospital here? Maybe correct me if I'm wrong on this, okay? Is the way a lot of the doctors is they operate under separate businesses. So when you look at the, when you look at, when you look at the data, you see a lot of MD practition businesses set up. Okay, so the way that they're reporting is that you would think, well, there's, there's 50 doctors at that hospital, all those 50 would be in that hospital. Well, that's not how they report out for, for businesses. They report out as individuals. So this number of businesses is really more of a reflection of how the health industry kind of reports itself. Okay, so it's kind of a, you know, when you're looking at stuff like that, it's like, how do, you, how do you handle that? That's a fluke of how the healthcare sector reports itself and hospitals report out, okay? But generally, this kind of even distribution, I think, is really, really good. I like that. Uh, distribution of firms, distribution by employment. Uh, again, you can see how this is kind of breaking out. There's more retail in Sauk City. That makes sense. Okay. Professional and technical services, more in Prairie du Sac. Food accommodations. Oh, what do you think that is? We can name names. Okay. <laughs> we won't name names. But you still get kind of that nice, neat distribution. Okay. I'm curious, I know what the name of that company is that's driving that, and I can't think of it off the top of my head. But there's one company that's in there that's, that's driving that. Okay. Another piece is home-based businesses. Um, there's not as many here. This kind of surprised me. I thought that there'd be more here because there's a lot of folks, that self-employed folks, that run their businesses out of their home. Okay, and I'm kind of surprised that that's not a bigger number. I thought that would be. Now, the implication, the reason I put this up here is that sometimes you can run into problems with uh, zoning in terms of running a business out of your home. Some zoning loss, uh, you're giggling. Is that, is that an issue? No, I was just, when you first said that, why isn't there more? I said they probably didn't get the permit. There probably mm. is more. <laughs> This is something that can be, um, a, a, it's a zoning issue. And, and maybe we need to kind of rethink our zoning laws to allow greater flexibility to run business. Now that doesn't mean that you can run a, I'm a car mechanic and I'm running, I'm running a shop out of my garage in a residential neighborhood. I mean, I'm not sure that would go over too well. But if I'm an accountant or I'm a lawyer and I want to have a home office that I'm running my business out of, that's very different. Okay, so we need to think about flexibility and how we allow that to occur. Okay, uh, women, one third of all businesses are operated by women. Okay, now this is something that a colleague of mine, Tessa Conroy, has been spending a lot of time on, is uh, how do, um, you know, women treat their businesses very differently than men treat their businesses. Okay, we did another study, one of these, um, how, uh, how, they, how different communities performed through the Great Recession. And what we found is that communities that had a higher percentage of their businesses that were owned by women did better through the Great Recession. Why would that be? Women treat their employees differently than men treat their employees. Okay. And I'm glad that Tessa is taking the lead on this because I feel really uncomfortable because it sounds, you know, you gotta be careful on what you say here. But women treat their businesses very, very differently than men, okay? The other thing is, is that we know that uh, a vital part of business success is the ability to do networking like this, okay? The Chamber of Commerce and the ability, how many of you heard the phrase, it's not what you know, it's who you know? Extremely important when you run your own business, okay? You gotta be part of that network, okay? The challenge is, are women welcomed into that network, okay? Some communities, that's not a problem at all. Other communities, it's really a problem. So that's something that the community needs to be thinking about, okay? 
uh, do, 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 CEO. Uh, let's see now. There's a mining company here. It's actually a mining service company that's in Prairie Sac that's owned by a woman. Um, retail, um, information services, predominantly owned by women. There's a management company. Uh, I don't know what that management company is. There's one, it's owned by a woman. But you can kind of see here the different types of businesses and how you know, it's distributed by women CEOs. Okay. The average firm size, yes, the typical business, woman-run business tends to be smaller. Okay, but again, you gotta look at the averages here because there's a couple of businesses here that are quite big that can distort this average. Okay, so the typical woman-owned business tends to be smaller. There's an opportunity here, I think, in terms of how can we work with women entrepreneurs, women business owners to help them grow their business. Okay, how they approach their business is different than men. So the strategies that might work for men-owned businesses may not work for women-owned businesses. Something to be thinking about. Okay, so small business development is becoming ever more important. Women and minority business owners are becoming an increasingly important part of the entrepreneurial mix. Okay, why would someone want to live in Salt Prairie and start their business here? This is where we're getting that kind of jobs, jobs follow people. One of the things that we're finding more evidence of is that people make a decision on where they want to live and then they start their business there. Okay, so the idea here really is kind of turned it around is rather than focusing on trying to attract businesses to come into the area, we want to attract people to come into the area and then we want to help them start a business. It's a different way of thinking about the economic development process. Okay? How can the community be more welcoming to newcomers and help foster new business startups? Okay? How many of you have moved, and I don't want to answer the second question, have, have moved into Sauk Prairie from outside? Okay? Did you feel welcomed? Did you feel as though you were welcomed into the community with open arms? or were you treated as an outsider? We did an economic summit of, in southwestern Wisconsin, okay? And one of the reoccurring themes is that if you're not from here, you're from away, and you're not to be trusted, okay? How are those communities structured for economic growth and development? Okay, they're not, okay? So this welcoming of newcomers, is really very, very important. And as an economist, I don't know how to get over that because it's a, it's a, it's a cultural phenomenon, okay? And as an economist, I'm not sure how to, how to address that, okay? Now, where does the economy look like it's going to into the future? Uh, those of you that have seen me talk before about the, the, the economic forecast, how many times did I come in and say, we're going into a recession? <laughs> how many times was I right? Ed, thank you. <laughs> I wasn't expecting an answer, but thank you. <laughs> what would we do without experts? Okay, so you gotta take this all with a grain of salt. We're, 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 we're trying to do our best. Okay, so again, what we're doing here is that this is a service of the Wall Street Journal. They go out and they survey 65, 70 or so people that do economic forecasting for a living, okay? And what they do is they essentially take those and they provide kind of an average. What's the average economic forecast? Any individual forecast is probably going to be wrong, but if you take an average, it tends to be pretty good. That's what these, see these, red. this is the actual, this is historical. What actually happened is the gray bar, okay? What we have here then is kind of this range, the little light like gray bars are kind of the highs and the lows, and then you can see the average there's the red. How close was the average to what actually happened? Those are pretty spot on. Uh, there's a bad one. Uh, that's not too bad, but a lot of these are really spot on. So what we wanna do, so we wanna look at what that, what's that average forecast look like, and then kind of the, the highs and the lows, okay? So this is the forecast for gross domestic product. That's kind of our granddaddy measure of the economy and where we're going. What I've done is I've got an average and then I computed a standard deviation and then added a standard deviation and subtracted a standard deviation. 
what that standard deviation is essentially is telling you is what's the distribution around that average. The smaller the standard deviation, the tighter that distribution. The bigger the standard deviation, the wider it is. Notice that as we go out into time, it gets wider. That's because as we go out in, uh, farther into the future, uh, our uncertainty becomes higher and higher, okay? It's just harder to forecast out in the future. But what's the trend here? The trend here going out is less than 2%. This is an extremely slow growth rate, okay? I think we're gonna go look back historically and say that this is, the, this is the lost decade in terms of economic growth because growth has been so slow. It's been steady, steady. We're in the longest recovery since the federal government started collecting data in the late 1800s. We're going into year 10, past year 10 of a recovery. We're setting records. The record though is extremely slow growth. Okay, and that's what folks are continuing to think. It's extremely slow growth. Okay, what's gonna to happen to monthly employment growth? Okay, this is something that comes out. There's a couple of numbers that people kind of pay a lot of attention to. One is the monthly unemployment rate. The other is the monthly job growth rate. Remember back when uh, Scott Walker was uh, governor and there was this debate about what's the right job growth number to use? It was the monthly estimate versus the, the quarterly estimate. And, and the, the, the argument was the gold standard. It's those job reports, okay? Why is it so slow? Um, I think it's because a lot of the jobs that we're generating just don't pay a whole lot of money. And we're not seeing that wage growth. We're starting to see a little bit of wage growth now, okay? So I'm surprised that those numbers aren't picking up a little bit, okay? Because we're seeing wage growth. If you see wage growth, people have more money in their pocket to spend, and that will spur the economy. Okay? But what's happening here with a lot of these forecasts is that we're going into year 10 of an expansion. It can't last forever. Okay? We also had a situation where we had the yield curve inverted itself. The yield curve is the difference between short-term interest rates and long-term interest rates. Historically, long-term interest rates are higher than short-term interest rates. Why would that be? Well, in the long term, there's more risk more stuff can happen. People that are loaning the money need to be compensated for that risk. In the long term, inflation can eat away at it, so you have to pay a higher interest rate, okay? So what happens if now all of a sudden short-term interest rates are higher than long-term interest rates? Something's out of whack. And if we talked last year, that happened. And if history repeats itself, we should be heading into a recession, okay? Well, that yield curve has gone back to the way it should be. Okay, well, does that mean that all bets are off? So there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of kind of, you know, that's why I started off with that, uh, you know, experts have been wrong, because there's so many mixed signals going on here, okay? But the one thing that is, is that we should be seeing a slowdown in the amount of job growth. Okay, it should be slowing down. This is nationally. Now, why is it slowing down? Some folks have argued it's because we don't have the bodies to fill the jobs. Okay, we can't generate jobs if we don't have people to fill those jobs. This is where immigration policy comes into play. Okay, or is it simply that this recovery can't keep going on forever? It's got to eventually slow down and go into a weak recession, okay? What about the unemployment rate? It should maybe tick up. Again, this is national. It should start to tick up a little bit. But again, you're looking at, you're looking at less than 4%, two years out in the future. What about the inflation rate? Inflation rate's gonna be flat. There is no reason to expect the inflation rate to pick up, okay? Now, that's one of the reasons that we should continue to see our interest rates stay low. If there's no inflation, that's, if we have low inflation, that should keep interest rates down. And that's what we're forecasting here. Although they're saying that interest rates will tend to tick up a little bit, okay, 
it's still, you're looking at, you're looking at 2.5%. That's free money. If I can borrow money, if I can borrow a lot of money at 2.5%, I'm going to take as much of that loan as I possibly can because it's basically free money. Okay? Now, the federal fund rate. This is what, when you hear about the Federal Reserve Bank setting monetary policy, this is one of their big tools. This is the interest rate that they impose on banks. At the end of the day, banks have to have a certain amount of cash on hand. Some banks have more than they need. Some banks have less than they need. Okay? In order to meet the law, the letter of the law, those banks that don't have enough cash on hand have to go in and borrow money. Okay? At what rate do they borrow money? That's this. Okay? And this, the Federal Reserve sets. So this is based on policy. And trying to forecast policy is really difficult to do. But the idea here is that it's still going to be fairly low. But, and notice that as we go farther out, those bands get bigger and bigger and bigger. Because as we go farther out, it's like, ah, uh, it's hard to guess. Okay? So interest rates are continuing to be low with a little upward pressure. What's the probability of recession in the next 12 months? About 25%. Okay, will, will the probability of recession in the next 12 months ever be zero? Never. Why? Because stuff happens. We assassinate a certain general, and the country that we assassinate gets mad and lobs bombs back at us. Stuff happens. Okay? So, the economy is performing at a slow and steady pace. Low unemployment and slow population growth is going to create a bottleneck for economic growth. Is that why we're forecasting fewer and fewer job creations in the future? Because we simply don't have the people to fill the jobs. People follow jobs or do jobs follow people? Increasingly, it's the latter. And that has tremendous implication for how Salk Perry goes about economic development. Small business development is increasingly important. Women and minority businesses are becoming increasingly important. Okay. The economy is going to grow at a modest pace over the next few years, but a high degree of disagreement amongst the experts. Okay. So, some things to think about in terms of the Salk Prairie region. Well positioned to experience stable economic growth and development. There's a good balance in the business mix. Mix of industries and mix of sizes. Well positioned to benefit from the growth of the Madison area. Well positioned to foster the strategies around placemaking. Let's make this place the best place to live that we possibly can. We're investing in parks. We're investing in recreation. We're trying to pretty up the riverfront. We're trying to pretty up businesses. Okay? We're trying to make this a really cool place to live. And we're willing to invest in our schools to do that. Okay? That's a placemaking type strategy. Focus on business networking and learning opportunities. Explore housing development opportunities. If the idea is that we want to make this a really good place to live, people want to move here. They have to have housing in order to move to. From the conference last year, housing may be an issue. Okay? Continue to focus on natural amenity-based assets, recreation, and continue to take a regional approach as you're doing. And I'll stop there. that you don't want to hold to the end. We can take a couple now for Dr. Della. Yes. It's a little low. It's about uh, national, nationally, it's about, don't quote me on this, but about 36, 37%. So just a little on the low side. Not terribly out of the way. But, it's, but if you look at that ownership over time, women's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and minorities is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the fastest growth rate is African-American women. It's the fastest growing single category. I may have missed it, but I can hear you address real estate tax. How does that fit into this world? Real estate tax? A lot of the research essentially comes down 
to say, do people think that they're getting what they pay for? Okay? If I'm getting really good quality services, I'm willing to pay for that. But if I think that my money's being wasted, then I've got a problem. So it's not the absolute level of the property taxes. That doesn't really matter. What matters is whether or not people think they're getting their money's worth. But as a comparison to Dave County, <laughs> Oh, much lower. Much lower. Uh, Dane County, uh, the property taxes in Dane uh, City, the city of Madison are particularly high. Um, I just got my property tax bill, trust me, they're really high. <laughs> um, but I think that's because the housing market in Madison is overinflated. On the one hand, I look at my assessed value and go, woo, hey, my retirement fund. All right, I'm going to sell this and move into a more modest place. Great. And then I look at the tax bill that's attached to it and went, oh, shh, ugh. Okay, so it's a love-hate relationship with, with the tax assessor. <laughs> um, but generally, the research is suggesting that taxes don't matter as much as you think they would matter. They really don't in terms of the larger economy. It boils down to is government efficiency. Okay, and this is where places like Chicago get into real hot water when it comes to taxes because people have the perception, and it may be true in the case of Chicago, that their money's being wasted. There's the classic story when Mayor Daley, the old Mayor Daley, Richard Daley, not the son, uh, there was a, the, the, a young um, uh, professional uh, management efficiency guy came in and said, Mayor Daley, I have a way to figure out how to go from four garbage men per truck down to three garbage men per truck. It will save us a lot of money. And the mayor said, son, come back when you can figure out how to justify five guys on a truck. Why would Daley want that? Patronage. Okay, is that an efficient way to run government? No. Okay, so in a place like Chicago, yeah, there's, there's a problem because people feel so their money's being wasted. But I'm not, is, what's the general feel here? Do you think so you're getting what you pay for with your services? Or do you think there's a lot of waste? Now there's a difference between frustration and waste. Okay, when you start feeling as a community that they're wasting our money, then that's what Madison is having the debate right now about this, the city golf courses. Is that a waste of city money to continue to fund these golf courses? Okay. And you're going to get people, the city's going to invest in the golf courses uh, because it's part of the quality of life um, metric, and you're going to get a lot of people, those that don't play golf, that think it's a complete waste of money. Okay, but that's the public dialogue. Yes. I've heard the term before, bedroom community. Yes. Proceed to the soft, soft prairie areas, bedroom communities in Madison. Are we? No, no. I don't. I don't think it is. Um, and having grown up in a bedroom community in Chicago, this is not a bedroom community. Okay. But it has the potential to think in terms long term to think if we start to view ourselves as a bedroom community and start to promote that idea, right? Then we're gonna get more people moving into the area and then we can start to create small businesses out of those folks that have just moved here. So it's not a bait and switch, but it's a different way of thinking about it. The, the industry distribution that you saw, what are we missing compared to other Oh. Come back to me later on that one. Okay. Um, I would think that based on Randy Stoker's work, um, nice restaurants, um, arts and entertainment, places that you can go see. Is there a place you can go see a live band in the area? Um, places like that. Places like that. But uh, I, I'd have to really think about that. Um, I think we need to keep moving on. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. One, One thing, thing I would like to say is, Dr. Deller, you did an amazing job this year on really diving into Salt Prairie specific businesses, and I really appreciate that. 
We will have these slides available that we can share with you. I also would like to thank Mark Fry and Kurt Wenger. We are actually live streaming this morning's program and we can share that link with you later. Yes, sorry. Um, <laughs> you're, you are all good this year, so no problems there. Um, it is easy when we talk about data and what's occurring in our community to forget about some of the good news items that have occurred over the years. So we want to just take a moment to go through some of the photos and help celebrate the Sauk Prairie community. With seven annual events, there's always unique things to do, but 2019 brought even more attractions to the Riverway. The Great Sauk State Trail officially opened all 13.1 miles and was enhanced by art sculptures, history boards, and amenities. And if all of that biking and walking works up a sweat, the community embraced and celebrated the new Riverfront Park. The park opened with a splash pad, zip line, kids playground, snack bar, and an ADA compliant canoe launch that will enhance the experience while visiting or competing on seven new irrigated soccer fields. These newly designed fields will help with some of the overuse that we now face as a community. And as day falls tonight, live music really heats up in the area with seven different venues hosting performing artists throughout the year. Experiencing day trips in Sauk Prairie continues to get easier with businesses like Home by Haley, Reach West Tea, LAF Boutique, all opening in 2019. And after a full day exploring, an unforgettable, unforgettable unique menu awaits. The much anticipated Wallersheim Bistro open, which delighted visitors to the winery, distillery, and those throughout the region. Visitors and residents were introduced to a new branding campaign for Merrimack called My Town, where exploring begins on the water and ends in the bluffs. New attractions such as Lake Wisconsin Cruises spent the summer sharing the lake with those who were visiting or from the area. Many business owners chartered Moonshine, the 52-foot yacht for staff outings. Others just simply enjoyed Lake Wisconsin for Friday night fish fries or fall color tours. And while the people of Sauk Prairie really like fun, 2019 wasn't all fun and games. We did work and we did recruit. Nine new businesses opened this year. And with each village or township having its own unique vibrant economies, the strategic location of the Sauk Prairie Riverway is becoming an interesting option for our neighbors to the east and west. I would encourage you to think about 20 acres of shovel-ready sites with attractive first occupancy incentives which are available. We celebrated the history of Salk Prairie with an episode of Wisconsin Hometown Stories and filmed another episode of Discover Wisconsin that will air in just a few weeks here at the River Arts Center. And while history needs to be preserved, things will inevitably change. The Baxter family purchased Balwick Chevrolet, the former Harley shop, and Salt Co. building. Buildings were demoed for a new hotel, Milwaukee Valve changed ownership, but the leadership remains and the same valves will continue to roll off that line as they will continue to operate as Milwaukee Valve LLC. As growth occurs, so does the need for public facilities and recreational areas. With strong schools and amenities, our school district saw a net increase of 51 students to reach a new high total enrollment of 2,840 in our district. As school leadership continues to plan for more growth in the future, they are committed to modernizing our facilities and offering innovative programs. Education is occurring on the Beyond 2020 construction pro proposal, details of which will be shared later this morning. Residents of the Sauk Prairie Riverway should be a proud of their improvements in 2019. The improvements are increasing interest in our community once again. Stakeholders from across the state have visited our trail and park system and have marveled at all we have accomplished in just a short time. Your generosity continues to make these types of investments possible.
For 2020, here are a few projects that will kick off. The Village of Sauk City will welcome a new hotel owner with the brand of Holiday Inn Express. This 72-room hotel includes an indoor pool, party room, fitness center, and several small meeting rooms. Of the 72 rooms, 46 will be standard queen, and the others will be suites. The Sauk City Library purchased the former Straight Forward Building and named it the George Culver Community Library after a generous donation from the Craig C. Culver Family Foundation. This beautiful space will be transformed to the library home and will serve the community for many years to come. And the Friends of the Sauk Prairie Parks and Recreation unveiled their plans for a 67-acre recreational facility. Our current athletic fields are used two and a half times the amount recommended, while we are certainly 42 acres short of parkland. This park will be a destination maker and economic driver for our community. Let's share a sneak peek of the soon-to-be Culver Community Park. Hi, I'm John Lehan with the Friends of Sauk Prairie Parks and Recreation. Let me be one of the first to welcome you to Culver Community Park, a 67-acre destination park for the Sauk Prairie area that will create memories for a lifetime. With this 21st century park, we will continue to strengthen and grow our thriving park system. We have fields that are overused two and a half times the amount recommended. We are 42 acres short of parkland based on National Parks and Recreation classifications. This community park will include a vast array of recreational amenities for all ages and abilities. This is a park for the people of Sauk Prairie, designated to meet our needs for generations to come. Let us show you our vision via 3D tour of Culver Community Park. Culver Community Park is located north of Sauk Prairie Road and south of the Westwind subdivision in the village of Prairie de Sac. We will start our tour entering on 21st Street with our 12,000 square foot inclusive playscape a place for play and learning. Here, children can develop physical and cognitive skills through play. This ADA accessible playground, where all ages and abilities are welcome, will include a poured rubber surface and numerous unique playground experiences. Adjacent to our playscape is our event building, designed for reunions, trade shows, weddings, and community events with seating for 300. The space will have garage doors that open up to our event green space to the east. A commercial kitchen will be available for catering or food service for hosted events. On the back side of the event building, we have our four sand volleyball courts and our event garden. The garden includes upper level seating overlooking the sports fields, lower level picnic table seating for patrons during events or tournaments, and a concrete games area for family and friends. The event building also has a concession stand, restrooms, offices, conference rooms, and lobby area. The park boasts fields and courts for more than a dozen sports. Let's start with our clover of ball diamonds. We have two baseball diamonds and two softball diamonds for our youth and adult baseball, softball, and kickball events. The diamonds will have skinned infields, irrigation, lighting, batting cages, bleachers, dugouts, and fencing. In the center of the four diamonds is the concession stand building, which includes restrooms, concessions, upper level press box, and maintenance storage. Two outdoor basketball courts, which are very popular and easy for just two people to play on add to our activity options. Our outdoor pond is stocked with fish, will be fenced and accessible with an ADA dock for a multi-generational experience. A dog park, skate park, and bike pump track will give pet owners, skateboarders, and BMX bikers a place in the park. Football, soccer, lacrosse, and other field sports will be able to play or practice on our four irrigated multi-purpose fields that are lined for soccer in this example. A fifth field designed to be the main competition field with lights and a scoreboard will be a great game day location. Ice skaters and hockey players will enjoy our outdoor ice rink. Our north shelter will have seating for 134 and serve as the hub for events in the northern part of the property. It includes a concession stand, restrooms, fireplaces, both indoors and out. The shelter's rental area provides ice skates, sleds, snowshoes, pickleball paddles, or any other rental items needed for the park. One of our strategic goals is to provide year-round recreation within this park, and winter recreation will be a major focus for our team. Quickly growing in popularity is pickleball. Our eight pickleball courts and two tennis courts, complete with fencing, windscreens, and lighting, will provide an incredible court experience. 
Our sledding hill will offer hours of winter fun with easy access along a paved asphalt trail. Thank you for taking a tour of Culver Community Park. To donate to our campaign to create memories for a lifetime, please visit our website at www.spparksandrec.org. Hello, I'm Marietta Ryder, owner of Tools of Marketing. Culver Community Park is the largest project the Sauk Prairie community has ever undertaken. The largest donation Tools of Marketing has helped with in the past was $10,000 to the bike trail. We are committing $25,000 a year for 10 years for a total of $250,000 to this project. The Culver family made the huge commitment to get us started. Now let's be the truly great community that I know we are and raise the rest of the funds needed to make everything in this park a reality. My husband Mark and I have also committed personally and are putting this in our estate plan. Everyone can give something and if everyone gives what they can, we will all accomplish this together. This is the legacy I want to leave for Sauk Prairie. Please join me in making this happen. If you would like more information about this project, John and I would love to sit down and talk with you about it. Thanks Sauk Prairie for being such a great community, the one I am proud to call home. And the village of Prairie de Sac will begin construction on the downtown riverfront park this spring. This will be a park for the community adjacent to the river and the Great Sauk State Trail. Improvements will be made to the parking area, a new eagle viewing platform, which will lead to a tiered outdoor seating area overlooking an outdoor performance stage. There will also be a railroad theme play area and a river outlook as additional riverfront amenities for residents and visitors to enjoy. It is indeed a great time to be in Sauk Prairie. Due to our collaborative spirit, recreational and healthy lifestyles initiatives, the community received the Wisconsin Healthy Community Silver designation, which recognizes communities that encourage efforts to improve overall community health and well-being. Sauk Prairie Healthcare took the lead on this project, bringing together over 40 plus community representatives to identify cooperation across multiple sectors, including economic development and health improvement. Let's continue on our investments in 2020 and beyond while we invite people to experience the Riverway. And speaking of investments, Superintendent Jeff Wright is here this morning to talk with you about the school district's Beyond 2020 plan. I give you Jeff Wright. Thank you, Twana. Yes. You might working for us. Away. We'll find out. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for giving me a few minutes to talk about some of the construction plans that the district has been discussing over the past four or five years, really, but much more seriously over the past few months. One of the things that we did to explain this project was to send out a survey to every address in the Sauk Prairie community in October. I just want to highlight some of the quick responses from that survey. Uh, we have a 92% rate, uh, express, of, of those who expressed an opinion, 92% said that they were either very satisfied or satisfied with the education that we were providing in the school district. And as Tawana said, I think that's translated into an increasing enrollment rate in our community with over 50 new students this year over what we had last year with now the highest enrollment that the Sauk Prairie School District has ever had. I promise you I did not coordinate my presentation with Dr. Deller in advance, but when I heard him talking about that jobs follow people and investing in the things that make people want to live in a space and call it home and emphasizing recreation and education, that certainly this, this project that I get to share with you this morning is a part of what we're seeing is, is a chance to make sure that our schools remain great places to teach and learn, are innovative, innovative, safe, welcoming places that also have the capacity we need to meet the increasing demand of more and more families choosing to raise their children in Sauk Prairie. So the question that we've asked ourselves for five years, why are we doing this? Why are we having this conversation? And the main goals that we identified several years ago is that we believe this building, our Sauk Prairie High School, 
has the capacity to remain our, our community's high school for the next 30 to 50 years on this site, as long as we make the investments now to keep it a safe and welcoming and efficient school. The school is approaching its 60th birthday, uh, and just like any home, there are some things we need to invest in to continue to make sure that this is a school that can welcome the number of students that we have for the next 30 to 50 years. We also need to replace some athletic facilities throughout the community that are aging, that if we replace them now, we're going to be able to continue to use them. We know that there are some things that are aging out after the decades that we've used these. And as John highlighted in the video, we also have been overusing some of these facilities for a long time. And so we need to look at how we can more efficiently use our space and potentially add some space for recreation and athletics. And the third goal that we identified in the, like, why are we doing this, is looking at Merrimack Community Charter School. It's amazing that only 12 years ago, that school had about 57 students in it. Over winter break, four more students moved in, and so now we're pushing 145. There's one set of bathrooms in that building. We've, we, we've, reached, we've reached capacity, which is a, a dream come true for those who worry that we are gonna close that school down, but people are continuing to choose to move their families to the Merrimack area and enrolling in that school, and so we need more classroom space to make sure we can meet the needs of that growing school. So how are we doing this? What our promise to the community is, is that we don't want to fix something now that we have to refix later. Let's dig once. And the easiest example I have for that is our community stadium complex that's, that's beyond the high school here. If we were to fix all the things that are wrong with our existing stadium, both bleacher sets need to be repaired. We had a fire on one of our light poles during a Friday night football game this past fall. Maybe you were there for those fireworks. Uh, we have turf issues, we have bald spots on the running track. So we have several things we need to repair and replace in that community stadium. But if we were to replace it where it currently sits, we wouldn't be able to expand the high school to the northwest, which is the only place we really can expand it for some of the increased facility needs. So let's do it right once. So the plan is to shift the high school stadium closer to the middle school, which is on this map as number eight, which allows us then to build future additions to the northwest and north of our high school. We're not advocating for every single addition that's on this plan in front of you, but we worked with a team of architects and engineers to say, how could we add on to this building over the next several decades, and how do we make sure that there's space? And they said, well, there's only space if you shift around the whole campus plan and athletics facilities. So you're going to have to do that now so you don't fix something and 10 years later regret that you fixed it where you fixed it. And so this is a master plan with that goal of saying, how do we make sure that we're only digging once and fixing something in the right place? So the proposed plan that we've advanced is a significant rehabilitation of our high school. If I were to bring Len Brzezinski, our buildings and ground person, in here and ask him to tell you about some of the physical needs of this building, he'd quickly tell you about the fact that we still have the original wiring and lighting systems in the core of the building, that we replace about 500 feet of pipes for our heating system in the tunnels beneath the building every year. This is expected in a building that was built in the early 60s. Madison School District just this week had headlines about their plan to invest about $80 million in each of their four high schools, the newest high school built about the same time ours was. But after several decades of use, it's time to reinvest in these buildings to make sure that we're able to use them for the next 30 to 50 years. Other communities have made the same decision. I already mentioned a campus redesign to make sure that we have room for the right athletic and recreation spaces in the correct spots. A pool addition is included in that. I'll talk more in detail about that in a second. And then also in addition to Merrimack Community Charter School, which includes classrooms to the north toward the water tower, and a gym, kitchen, and new bathroom set uh, to the south. So let's talk specifically about, the, uh, specifically about the building that you're in. And I think that when you come into this space, the newest space, it seems like this high school is in perfect condition. Uh, it's amazing that this space is already over 20 years old. Uh, for those of you who are here to vote and, and help with construction of this project. Uh, but a lot of parts of our building have some significant need. So we've asked the question, can you fit a modern high school into an older building? 
and we've looked to our neighbors, Beaver Dam, Mount Hora, Baraboo. You can see that they built high schools at the, about the same time that we did, and these communities have made the same decision that we're asking the community to make now by reinvesting in their schools. This is Baraboo High School. If you haven't had a chance to drive by, their old building made new. This is the inside of Baraboo High School and part of their new tech ed area with garage doors that allow for incredibly flexible spaces between classrooms. This is Oregon High School, again a building that's slightly older than ours, and how they took existing spaces and reinvested in them to make them more flexible work and learning spaces, uh, and also redid the internal organs of these buildings at the same time. More pictures of Oregon High School. These are some of the improvements that we've targeted uh, in making this investment. We would put fire suppression sprinklers throughout the entire building that doesn't exist now, redo the air handling. We'd be able to be more, a more energy efficient building by being able to heat and cool specific places based on use, which we really can't do now. Separating community and student use, which we can't do now because at this point, if there were a swimming event in the pool, you can get into the lobby of the River Arts Center because the entire building is open because of the way that the current building and fire egress is set up, we'd be able to change that and lock off sections of the buildings to make it more secure. We'd also like to add a new entrance to the building so that almost all people come in through one entrance instead of multiple entrances like we have now. The proposal is to put the addition on facing the main student parking lot. So if you were to come down Grand Avenue toward the high school where the sign is that has all of the circles for each of our state championships, <clears throat> if you were to stand at that sign, you'd be looking across the parking lot at the new main entrance. So visitors, students, buses could all drop off in one location and have students all come in through one entrance. That main entrance then also serves as the lobby for a lot of our large events in the gyms, where we could put a school store up front, right off the north gym, and so guests coming in for evening events could just be in that section of the building instead of ac having access to the full building like we have now. Pools, that's a really big word, pools. It looks smaller on my screen. We have a few proposals for what we would like to look at with our swimming pools. We know that the existing swimming pool here at the high school uh, is, has about four or six years left in its lifespan. And so instead of replacing the exact pool we have, we'd like to make it so that we have more pool use available to the community all year round and all day long. So the plan that we're proposing, there's a main competition pool that we would continue to use for physical education, lifeguard training, and our swim teams. And then a glass wall would divide that pool from a warm water pool that we could use for adaptive physical education and therapy, but the community then could use throughout the entire day. Right now, swimming is, used, is restricted to times when our PE classes aren't using the pool. But now we could have toddler swimming classes, senior exercise and other classes, lap swimming throughout the day with its own entrance. And so if I push this laser button, this is now the new entrance to the pool area. You'd come in here, check in as a community member. You can't get into the rest of the high school. If you swim now, if we all came back to swim at lunch today, you check in at the main office and you get to walk through the whole high school to get to the pool area, and then we all use the same locker rooms. The new plan, you'd come in here, you'd go down a separate community set of locker rooms, and then get access to the pool that is open for your use at that time. In the evenings and on weekends then, this entire complex becomes open. So we can have lap swimming in some sections, this part of the pool will actually have a zero entry area for youth and for those who can't get access to a pool through stairs. So having one complex that would have two pools, one smaller and one more traditional lap pool, uh, but with those separate locker rooms for community use and student use. This is the outdoor pool. When we did the community survey, the most popular project was the outdoor pool. We didn't know that, we didn't anticipate that, so I guess that's why you send out a survey, to learn what the community feels about certain investments, and protecting this pool and investing in it for the long haul was the most popular project on the list. And so, working with Raymaker, we've talked about how we can redesign the space, make it a better space, but also make some significant investments in the pool house and the safety of the pool deck to make it also last that 30 to 50 years we'd like to see for all of these facilities. Again, our plan for the community stadium, we're shifting the stadium from its current location right here toward the north, closer to the middle school, a competition soccer field uh, and practice field adjacent to it, 
These fields already exist for practice. We would keep those, and then we move our baseball and softball fields to the southernmost part of the property because they have been taken up by this, the stadium here. The community stadium would now have 2,000 seats on this side instead of being split 750 on one and 500 on the other, which makes it much easier for us to use for graduation, marching band competitions, and other big community events where we want one side to be the, the, the audience and not a backstage where half the audience has to sit watching the backup performers. Merrimack, a pretty simple addition of classrooms to the north, a gymnasium to the south with new bathrooms and a kitchen area. And the way this is designed is the same thing we did with Tower Rock and Bridges Elementary. We're able to separate the community use features of the building and the classroom area of the building so we can close off these doors here. And on the weekends and in evenings, the gymnasium becomes rentable. Community teams, recreation leagues could use the gym, the cafeteria, and those bathrooms and kitchen areas without getting access to the classroom function of the building. How much does this cost? Uh, this, is, this is the estimated mill rate impact is about 76 cents per the, for the mill rate, which translates to $76 more per year on a $100,000 home. You do the math, $140 to $150 for a $200,000 home, continue to add $76 per year per $100,000 of assessed value of your home. We are, this would return us than to the, the tax rates that we had as a school district in 2015 and 2016. I'm really grateful that we've made decisions over the last many years to put ourselves in a really good financial circumstance as a district. This year we are paying down over a, around a million dollars on existing debt on Bridges and Tower Rock so we can pay off those loans earlier. That will save us $750,000 in interest payments over the life of those loans. So those 20-year loans that we took out a few years ago, we're anticipating paying off in 13 to 15 years. It's saving us millions of dollars as a community, but it's also situated in us in a place where when I share this number with my superintendent colleagues, that we could borrow $65 million and have an impact of 76 cents on the mill rate. Like, how did you do that? That, that's, other communities are $1.50, $1.80 for the same amount of money. Uh, a big part of that, thank you. A big part of that is because we've been so aggressively paying off existing debt and have the ability to borrow $37 million with a zero impact to the tax rate, and that this additional amount would then allow us to complete all of these projects. There's a lot of stuff on this screen, but I thought it was important to show you, so how did the community respond to the projects that I've just reviewed? And these are the res responses to the survey that we, we shared in October, divided up by all residents that took the survey, parent residents that are not staff, and non-parent residents that are also not staff. And then looking at the, the different projects that we proposed and I've just reviewed, with a 10 being an absolute yes, and a one being an absolute no. So it, we, we read this as that most of the people who chose to respond to the survey felt good about these projects and the direction that we were taking the school district. We had a 24% response rate to the survey. The goal is an 18% rate in order to get enough surveys back to have a statistically significant sample. This past Monday, I met with the school board and I pre presented five different options to them from doing nothing to just investing in Merrimack and the stadium as the two things that we saw most needing immediate investment to adding the high school, adding pools. And then there's one additional addition that has been added to this. In addition to this River Art Center space, we have now reached capacity in how we as a community use this space. And River Arts approached us with at least a one and a half million dollar commitment in private donations to make this addition take place. And so the school district is also considering an addition to this space because over half of it has been paid for already through private donations that we're really grateful for. I'd love to know what you'd do if you were on the school board. We do have some information sheets that Tawana is gonna have a team pass out. One is just an information sheet about all of these plans so that if you have questions later on, you can look at it and give me a call. 
I also have a half sheet that just is an opportunity to give some feedback so that I can present this to the school board as they make a final decision, probably on Monday night, if we would pursue a referendum in April or if we would delay these projects until November or a, 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 another year unknown. But I certainly would love your, uh, your opinion. I, I'm grateful to all of those who return the surveys back in October to help direct our work. This has been a four or five year project. Uh, was, it's been a, an honor to share some of this information with both you and with community groups throughout the past few months as we've been trying to teach about these projects in ways that we can invest in our school district to hopefully attract those families uh, as Dr. Deller talked about earlier. I know the plan is to transition into all of us answering questions, Tawana. Do you want me to answer a few questions right now? I get a few minutes. If you have questions that you'd like to ask specifically about the projects that I've shared about this morning, I'd be glad to answer a few questions before we bring the other municipal leaders up here to answer the questions. Yes, John? Thanks. The, the question, question is, is, would the outdoor pool be moved? No. It is an investment in the existing pool structure. Yep. Exactly. We're rehabbing the existing pool house, so we would save the old, the historic pool house and upgrade that. Uh, the plumbing system is in there, tuck point the building. We would change some of the pool deck itself, get rid of the like one foot deep kiddie pool. I've heard a lot of other names for that pool um, that involve <laughs> other things I want to talk about right now. Uh, having little kids myself, I can guess where that name came from. Uh, but it would be more of a, 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 a zero depth area of water play with some water features. Uh, to make it easier for families and little kids to play in some water uh, in that space and not just sit in the one foot deep pool. So, but yes, it'll stay at Grand Avenue. Jenny? Yeah, I'm a of your, of your efforts here, but my question would be, what are we doing to retain and attract really quality teachers in the software district so that we continue to have a really good school district? That seems to be one of the most important pieces. Thanks. If you were here a year ago, this is what I talked about, it was, it was about some of our, our issues around teacher recruitment, staff recruitment, and retention, especially regarding our salaries and benefits. Uh, we did make significant changes to those salaries and benefits this past year, and we now have a $14 minimum wage for adults who are working with our, with our children. Uh, Tawana spoke really passionately at the end of our presentation last year that we shouldn't have St adult staff members who are taking care of some of our most sensitive and needy children in the entire community who have other students who leave the school to go get paid more at other jobs in town uh, and, as high school kids. And so we made some really big adjustments. And so I, we're grateful for the support of the community to make those investments. We are changing some of our outreach to, to get our circle a little broader. And I think what Dr. Deller talks about, that stretch commuter, that we, are, we also have to stretch our recruiting and so we're going to more universities to do recruitment fairs to make sure that we have people seeing Sauk Prairie as a really attractive option to, to continue their career as teachers. We have very few brand new teachers that come to Sauk Prairie. We have a lot of people who are partway into their career who are looking for a place to stay for a long time and make a commitment to a community. We want to be attractive to those people. Jeff? Thanks. It's, it's the, the most important part of the project to those of us who have been doing this, but it's the least exciting. Uh, when we talk about this project, people want to talk about the specifics of the swimming pool, <laughs> or want to talk about specifics, specifics of turf versus natural grass. Those are big decisions, and I get why we should be talking about them, but what matters most to those of us who are responsible for making sure that this building can meet the needs of kids is what are the internal organs like? And this building has served us really, really well, and we trust that we have the capacity with adding a few, we're gonna add about six more classrooms in this addition, um, but we also have to make sure that the air handling systems work and that the plumbing works and electrical is as modern as possible. And those are the big investments that cost a lot of money, but aren't ever going to be as exciting as the video that John shared of the Culver Community Park. Uh, but if you would like to go and tour underneath our pool, I would love to show you some of these infrastructure problems that we have in the district. That might be exciting. Uh, and be glad to show you those. We're already here. It'll be, quick, it'll be a quick walk, and I have a key. <laughs>
that actually has my name on it, which I've never understood why my name is on the master key to the district, because if I lose this, everyone's going to know it was my fault. <laughs> and now you know. I wanted it to say 112A. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to know, hopefully, to bring it right back to me. So other questions? Depends on who finds it. Yes, yes Steve. Steve. Uh, are you considering this as a one mark project or a phased approach to uh, spread this out? The question that Steve asks is about, are we looking at this as one project or a phased project? I have presented both options to the school board. If they're going to go to referendum in April, they have to make a decision next week because of a 75-day requirement as an advanced warning to, the, to get it on a ballot, um, which is why we've been working on this for several years and shared the survey in October. So the school board's looking at both options. Unfortunately, we can't do the large high school investment until we make some of the other investments because I can't add on I can't move the classrooms and the internal organs of this building and the pool until I have room outside to do so, which requires moving the stadium further south. And so unfortunately, there's a row of dominoes that have to fall before we can make the investments to the high school. But they are looking at several different options of phasing this over several years or doing this all at once. Interest rates are certainly being considered in that discussion. Dr. Della, you shared that there's a prediction to them slowly increasing, not, not rapidly. Uh, I, I got that from Dr. Deller. And so they're looking at that as an option. If you want to reach out to your school board members right now, it's a great time to give your opinion on that or to put it on the half sheet. Do you want me to invite my friends up here, Tawana? Um, I would ask the administrators just to be flexible if anyone has a question for any projects that we <coughs> Sauk City, Prairie de Sac, Merrimack, Town of Prairie. Um, you can ask it and I'll pass a, a microphone to them. The one thing that I would like to say, because you know I always have words and thoughts on things, is both of the projects that were presented to you, if we go back six or seven years, there was a team of eight to ten people that met every so often, and we planned and we visioned these projects together. And I know that one's a private and one would be tax-based, but I can assure you that every conversation, every thought was planned every step of the way as a collaborative approach. And we do need every square inch of these fields. I would also like to share with people that we just watched Edgewood High School spend a couple of years about not having the ability to play home games. When you hear in the community that if we don't do these investments to the high school, it is very possible that we can no longer host home games. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be that community. I don't want to be the community that has to alternate with a neighboring school to play Sauk Prairie sporting events. That's just one. If you haven't gone out and toured Baraboo High School, Mount Horb, some of these other schools, who have invested in older buildings, I would pull together a tour of folks to go do that because seeing it in photos doesn't do it justice. Our children deserve to be proud of the school that they walk into. For newcomers who are considering our community and the amenities that we have, to think when they walk away from our facilities, that is top notch. So this is just one of German's thoughts on why this project is so important. But I encourage you, if you do have time today, go with Jeff into the bowler room. One, it's an experience you would never forget. Ask him to walk you up to where our student athletes currently call themselves doing <coughs> strength and conditioning. You would be appalled. These investments are needed. All the projects that we're doing will be fabulous. I think they speak to the amenities that Dr. Deller discussed. And I would ask you to take advantage of this Q&A time and ask any questions that you have of Dr. Deller, of Jeff, or our area administrators. Yes, sure. 
I have to get to a phone conference, so I have to leave. And I hate to piggyback on a lot of what Jeff said here, but I did want to share that uh, right now in the town of Merrimack, aside from this great tourism thing we're working on, we have two new subdivisions coming in uh, that should be, I anticipate, fully approved this year with construction starting as early as 2021. So think about this, 120 new homes, uh, which will add millions and millions and millions of dollars to our tax base, not to mention possibly put that enrollment at Merrimack over 200 in the next 20 years. So uh, these are definitely some space needs that need to be addressed. And of course, we have levy limits, right? So every time we add another one and a half million dollar lakefront property, it helps tick that mill rate down. So we could even see that uh, some, somewhat levied off a little bit. So that's the only thing I had to add, and, and I'm sorry I do have to run. Um, I have a, this conference call I have to get on. Are there any questions of me real quick? All right, I'm out of here. Thanks. Read about me in the paper. It's been great. Questions for any of the administrators? Dr. Deller, any final thoughts? All right. Well, if there's no questions, I think it's time for some giveaway raffle items. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Roxy. Thank you. Yes. So just a reminder, we do have a survey we'd like to have you complete. If you wouldn't mind, possibly before you leave, we'll use this information for planning our event next year. And we also have a giveaway of a gift card. This is Lauren Olson. Lauren's responsible for all the uh, planning and organizing, works with Tawana to get this event planned. So we appreciate her help. And now she's going to go ahead. I'll let you draw the number her name. Oops. <laughs> Kevin. Kevin Hoshider. Kevin's still here? There he is. All right, good. Again, thank you all so much for coming. We'll be around uh, for anyone that has any questions. I think most of us will be here. And go ahead. And Cliff Thompson will be picking up the half sheet at the door if you want to provide feedback that way. And if you do want a tour, uh, Chad Harnish, our high school principal, and I will be glad to take people around the building. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much.